Hey, Deserving Listeners. Today I'm going to answer a bunch of questions that you all submitted about abuse. So let's get to it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Before getting into it, I just want to say that if you are yourself or you know anyone who is suffering from abuse or domestic violence, that you can call 911 or you can call the domestic violence uh, hotline, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. All you got to do is just Google National Domestic Violence Hotline or just the hotline, and they will be able to help you. This first question, I think a lot of these questions are from the Facebook fan page. You should be able to see a link below or just go to Facebook and go to Psychology in Seattle fan page. Jessa, she asks, I often hear the word abuse either overused or not used appropriately. How is abuse defined from a psychological perspective? How can someone know if they are in an abusive relationship? What are the symptoms of psychological abuse? That's a great question and a good one to start off with. Yeah, the term abuse is used in many contexts, but in my field, it's tend to be it tends to be used in very specific contexts. In the general culture on Twitter, people will, you know, potentially throw the word around in a very broad way, perhaps as a way of gaining uh, I don't know, sympathy from others instead of describing their situation in more detail, they just will use the word abuse because they're hoping that people will just understand what they mean by that. Not to say that people are lying, but you know, maybe some people are using the word abuse when they should be, be using something like hurtful or something like that. But let's define it. So first, I just want to talk about child abuse. You're not asking, Jessa, about child abuse, but I want to talk about that for a second because we'll probably get into that later and while we're talking about definitions here. So according to my state, Washington State, the law defines child abuse as the following. So uh, this is RCW, or Revised Code of Washington, 26.44.020. Abuse or neglect means sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, or injury of a child by any person under circumstances which cause harm to the child's health, welfare, or safety. So sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, exploitation or injury to a child by anyone under circumstances which cause harm to the child's health, harm to the child's welfare, or harm to the child's safety. So there are some obvious examples of this, like a parent getting angry and hitting a child with a baseball bat, an uncle having sexual contact. Oh, by the way, trigger warning for this whole episode. In order to talk about abuse, we're going to be getting into some very specifics. And I know many of you have complex PTSD or PTSD or other kinds of, you know, dissociation, for example. And, you know, pretty much every episode on this podcast, you have to be very careful. And I'm going to try to provide tr trigger warning. And obviously, a lot of you will see the title of this episode and will steer clear of it, given your traumas. You don't want to cause distress or trauma being triggered in you to a great distress level just because you're listening to a podcast. You want to you know, make sure you monitor that and talk with your therapist about what you can handle and, and what you should steer clear of. When in doubt, always steer clear. Um, you know, There's nothing in this episode that you have to hear. All right, so yeah, some obvious examples of child abuse. Like I said, hitting a child with a baseball bat, having sexual contact with a child, or pushing a child down the stairs. These are obvious. There's no justification. There's no... Uh, you know, it depends sort of a thing. These are under 100% of the time. There's no reason why you should be hitting a child with a baseball bat. There's no reason why you should be having sexual contact with a child. There's no reason why you'd be pushing a child down the stairs. Unless, I suppose, a train is coming to and to push the child out of the way, you have to push them down some stairs. But, you know, obviously, we wouldn't call that abuse. But there's a lot of not-so-obvious behaviors as well like not having enough food in the house because the parent isn't paying attention. That's also considered abusive neglect. Allowing a child not to go to school of any kind. This is also considered legally, potentially, depending as abuse and neglect. Not taking a child to the hospital when they need to go. Watching pornography in front of the children. Letting a child play around dangerous chemicals. Driving drunk with a child. Leaving marijuana out 
it. So a child might eat it or leaving other medications out. So a child might accidentally eat it. These are also considered by law, usually, depending on the adjudicators as abuse or neglect of a child. And the parent could be criminally prosecuted for this, or at the very least, the child, children could um, be, you know, uh, protected f from the parents by Child Protective Services in a variety of ways. As a therapist, a, you know, I don't know, a sizable portion of my career, I don't know, 10, 20 percent of my early career was spent with families where there was maybe, well, not that many, probably 5 percent, 3 percent. But, you know, you add all that up, that's probably 100 different clients or plus where this was the problem, where there were abuse allegations against the parents. And instead of taking the children away, which is actually a very expensive thing and a very drastic thing, they would hire me indirectly through other mediators, me, you know, other, you know, I don't know what you would call it, middle people. They would, I would eventually get the contract where I'd go into the home and help the families and help the children. And so I talked with a lot of parents about these kinds of events and treated a lot of parents who abused their children, or at least were uh, alleged to have. Okay, so that's child abuse. And I think it's, you know, the, the pretty obvious examples are, and even the not so obvious ones, you know, like watching porn in front of children. These are obviously not okay for a child. And we clinically define that as abusive or uh, abusive neglect what we'd call or, or sometimes just simply said neglect. So what is not uh, technically abuse to children? Well, maybe like you're on your phone a lot and your child is trying to get your attention. I don't know a lot of people that, that would call that abusive or neglectful. Maybe if it was a pattern and it was over time, probably wouldn't cross the line into legal abuse or neglect. Maybe people would label it from the outside. And that gets back to your question, Jess, of just like, you know, uh, there seems to be a lot of different definitions. And I'm giving you the legal definition, which is the definition for courts of law and for CPS, you know, Child Protective Services. But in my field of psychotherapy, we might have a broader understanding of abuse. It might not be, but it, it might be. And certainly in society, we might have a broader point of view. Let's say you have a, a non-clinician observing a parent who was on their phone a lot, they might say that's abusive. Okay, that's just that uh, observer's usage of the term. And, the, you know, it's just a word at that point. It's not a legal term. All right, so let's go into intimate partner violence or otherwise known as domestic violence. It's more uh, precisely named intimate partner violence. That's our clinical term. But commonly it's called domestic violence or DV, which we should also just remember that's what most people call it. So again, we have Washington law that defines this. It's not very uh, clear exactly what it means, but let me just read it. Uh, domestic violence includes, but is not limited to, any of the following crimes when committed by either A, well, I'm going to read this kind of funny. Let me start. Over. Domestic violence includes, but is not limited to any of the following crimes when committed by either one family or household member against another family or household member, or one intimate partner against another intimate partner. So I'm going to list all the different crimes. So they're saying basically if a household member or family member commits any of the following crimes against another household member or another family member or an intimate partner against another intimate partner, this is what we call domestic violence according to Washington law. There's a long list of crimes that are considered domestic violence under those circumstances. Assault of the first degree, assault in the second degree, assault in the third degree, assault in the fourth degree. And just pausing here on the list, a lot of domestic violence charges, I also, if sometimes I talk about this, have treated in the early part of my career domestic violence perpetrators who were um, accused or found um, uh, guilty of breaking a law of domestic violence in my state, and they were mandated to attend domestic violence treatment in lieu of going to prison as a way of trying to rehabilitate them, essentially. And I was an adjunct to the domestic violence treatment team. I was just a therapist, a family therapist, a group therapist who would sit in the group treatment and occasionally meet one-on-one -on -one with the perpetrators. And I learned a lot about 
DV and DV treatment in that time. And so a lot of the people that I treated were uh, convicted of assault in the fourth degree. In my state, and I'm not a lawyer, but from observation, what that seemed to indicate would be something like a husband who had a pattern of when he would get angry or jealous or upset at his wife, he would say, throw a chair at the wall. And he wouldn't be, he wouldn't hit her with the chair. So in his mind, he's like, I'm not assaulting her. But that's actually, from my memory, technically assault in the fourth degree. So you, assault in the first degree, that's the, the more severe assault charges. Assault in the fourth degree is the less severe charge and is, I believe, considered a misdemeanor and not a felony. And those kinds of low-grade assaults are definitely grounds for a, a criminal hearing and a conviction and potentially mandating domestic violence treatment. Um, but of course, you, domestic violence also incru, uh, includes assault in the first degree where you shoot someone because you know, you're trying to control your spouse or you push someone down the stairs. That's not assault in the fourth degree. That's, that's I don't know what degree assault that would be, but it's assault in the fourth degree I think was created, and again, don't take my word for it because I'm not a lawyer or history of the law, but I believe they created assault in the fourth degree to include those somewhat ambiguous behaviors that are definitely problematic and definitely controlling and definitely violent but maybe not necessarily violent against another person. Like I said, throwing a chair against the wall. If you are sitting there and your spouse is a pattern of anger and intimidation and they, they pick up, say, a, I don't know, an ashtray and they throw it at the wall above your head, even though they didn't hit you, it's pretty clear that there's a threat in there and that it's extremely problematic and we do not want people doing those kinds of behaviors, right? So... Now, there are some nuances there. What qualify, What if you took an ashtray and threw it in the opposite direction? Eh, you know, it could be quali- that could qualify for assault in the fourth degree. It really depends on the circumstances and your lawyers and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so other laws that are uh, considered domestic violence, again, when it's family member against family member, household member against household member, or intimate partner against intimate partner, is a drive-by shooting. So it's just kind of interesting that in Washington law, if a wife does a drive-by shooting against her wife, in the case of a lesbian couple, that is a domestic violence charge. Or if a son does a drive-by shooting against his, uh, you know, his father, that is potentially a domestic violence charge. It's just not usually something you usually think about, but it's included in the law. Reckless endangerment, coercion, burglary in the first degree, burglary in the second degree, criminal trespass in the first and second degree, malicious mischief in the first and second, third degree, kidnapping in the first and second degree, unlawful imprisonment. That's a pretty common one in in domestic violence and intimate partner violence is not letting someone out of the room when they want to. uh, It's, I believe, considered an unlawful imprisonment. And of course, locking someone in a room and not letting them out. Violation of the provisions of a restraining order, no contact order, or protection order, rape in the first degree and second degree, residential burglary, and stalking. So this is kind of interesting. I know some of you actually personally who have been a victim of stalking, maybe even currently, and it's against the law and for very good reasons that in Washington state, if, for example, your ex-husband were to break into your house, then that is not just only considered residential burglary, but it's also considered domestic violence because it's likely a power and control crime. Also, of course, stalking. So not stalking is illegal, but if you stalk someone that is a former partner or a current family or a family member, if you stalk like your sister or something, that is also considered a, a domestic violence crime. And also, finally, interference with reporting of domestic violence. So it's specifically a domestic violence charge if you interfere with the reporting of domestic violence. Um, For some of you 90 Day Fiance people, remember when we saw um, Colt uh, preventing, he took away Larissa's phone, or at least allegedly, 
And that would be an example of interference with reporting of the domestic violence if she, if Larissa was wanting to make that call to the authorities um, for uh, fear of her life or something like that. So, you know, th- all those crimes, which have their own definitions, of course, if they're done between family, household member, or intimate partner, then it's considered domestic violence which includes not only intimate partners, but also family members. And that's the technical definition. When we, when, we say, when we use the term domestic violence, we usually think of intimate partner violence, but domestic violence, if you just, if you just look at the term, domestic, home, and violence, violence, that it's basically any violence that occurs in or of the home, that may, if that makes any sense. And, and intimate partner violence is more specific to spousal relationships. Okay, so in psychology, though, we have a different definition. It's more broad and it's more, um, I think, specific, really. And one definition that I like, I sort of cobbled this together, is a pattern of behaviors to maintain power and control over another person in an intimate relationship. So let's break this down. So it's a pattern of behaviors, and that's key. But you know, we could also take some case-by-case examples where it isn't a pattern. You know, let's say that um, a spouse doesn't have any power and control behavior, so then all of a sudden just flips out and starts beating their partner. Well, I don't think anyone would claim that wasn't abuse, right? <laughs> but usually what we're talking about when we're talking about abusive behaviors, we're talking about a pattern of behaviors and the other part of it is to maintain power, to gain power and control over another intimate partner. And this is key, is that there's some people, and this was our distinction actually, was in the perpetrator treatment program, the domestic violence treatment team would assess the individual as they came in, usually on an assault for conviction. And the initial assessment was to determine whether or not this person had a quote unquote an anger management problem or a domestic violence problem. For those who did not have a pattern of control over their partner, then we started to look at, well, what happened? Is this a emotional regulation problem only? Because some people don't have that. They just have a hard time with impulse control. They have a hard time with their emotional regulation. Maybe they were intoxicated at the time and they don't have a pattern of behaviors to coerce or, or you know, control another human being. They lost it and this person might have a pattern of losing the control of their behaviors in a variety of contexts, not just with their intimate partner. They might have done it since they were young. They might lose control at work. They might lose control while they're on the road. Now, this isn't to say that this person isn't abusive, but we did try to determine what's going on here because some people need help with their emotional control and other people, basically their personalities are oriented towards abusing others. You know, for some people uh, who just have what we call an anger management problem, this person usually benefits and is essentially cured by learning emotional regulation skills. And that's not that hard to teach someone emotional regulation. But for the people that we determined to have a domestic violence problem, these people usually had something different or maladaptive about their personality that led to behaviors generating from a justified place. That was the other thing was people in the anger management group, they often did not feel like afterwards that it was justified. They might later say, yeah, I was really drunk and I lost control and I'm just so ashamed of what I did. I don't know what happened. Uh, sometimes I just I just see red and I, I just don't know how to, I try to stop. And so those people, not always, usually it's, they're a good candidate for what we call anger management and emotional regulation, maybe even PTSD treatment. But then there was another group of people who essentially had a personality disorder oriented towards abuse. Some of these people had narcissistic personality disorder. Some people had borderline. Some people had um, other kinds of uh, personality disorders or, or some kind of perceptual problem that isn't categorized within the personality disorder system or 
massive misogyny, you know, just the, it, domestic violence usually came from a place of, of entitlement or justification. And so for those people, it was much harder to treat them because they didn't usually think they needed treatment. They usually thought the whole thing was a, was silly. They thought, I'm only in here because the police are against men or something, or I'm only in here because, uh, you know, the, the government is a bunch of snowflakes or I'm trying to think of what else they would say. Um, I'm only in here because it was a misunderstanding or, I'm only in here because this was blown way out of control, or I'm only in here because the police always take the man away and not the woman or something like this. And there, there were just all these denials and justifications. And so treatment was much longer for these people, a year plus of group therapy and a lot of confrontation because we had to actually break them down em- uh, mentally. <laughs> I mean, it's not a great term, break them down, but essentially we had to change how they saw the world. We had to change how they saw themselves in the world. We had to change how they dealt with relationships, how they dealt with jealousy, how they dealt with attachment insecurity, how they understood the role of what a man is and what a woman is. This was extremely complicated. I mean, deprogramming someone on misogyny is difficult. <laughs> But we did it, and it was a beauty to watch. Uh, you know, a lot of it happened from the DV people, but, I, you know, I was there doing some of it too. And it was wonderful, you know. Usually around six months of just flat-out confrontation with these folks, they'd start to change their mind, and they'd start to say, huh, you know what, I'm starting to kind of see what you guys were talking about. And then the more veteran group members would start um, confronting the more novice because there was always there's a revolving door of perpetrators coming in and out of the group, and so there was a mixture of, you know, beginning people, intermediate people, and advanced people. And the advanced people were some of our best um, therapists, quote unquote, in the room because they w- knew what it was like and could speak with a lot of credibility to the novice perpetrators. But anyway, so um, again, it's a pattern of behaviors to maintain power and control over another partner in an intimate relationship. And we have a very useful thing called the abuse wheel. A lot of you people have probably seen it. You can just Google it. But I'm going to detail it here and and to to talk about what it's like to be in an abusive relationship. And uh, it has eight different sections, and let me just go through it. So, Jesse, you were asking, you know, what are the signs? Well, here here are the signs. Is... The perpetrator, it, they use coercion and threats. So these are the pretty obvious example, pretty obvious behaviors, you know, outright threatening the victim, outright controlling the victim. And I'm going to use the word victim. Some people like to use the word, perp, you know, a survivor, for example. But uh, in this instance, you know, they're really being victimized. And I'm not going to say that they're always a victim, but I, I am going to, I feel pretty comfortable when someone's the victim of intimate partner violence crime, then I'm pretty comfortable using the word victim. But just understand that they're not always a victim and it doesn't define them. So the second, so that's coercion and threats, pretty obvious. The second part here is using intimidation. So this is also pretty obvious, but not as obvious. This is making the victim emotionally walk on eggshells. This is smashing things to intimidate them. This might be displaying weapons. I, I had a client once that did this that, that just had a lot of guns and would leave them loaded just around the house, propped up against the wall or something. And it wasn't uh, explicitly a threat to, the, to their intimate partner, but it definitely came across that way. And it, again, is that abuse or is it not abuse. And the the key is, is how uh, it's a combination of a lot of things. So let's just say, you know, Jesse, you were asking, you know, what's the delineation? You know, what do we, we use the word abuse. Okay. So let's say you heard someone on Twitter saying, my husband leaves a shotgun, uh, two shotguns, two loaded shotguns propped up against the wall. That's abusive in my house. Okay. Well, it could be abusive and it also could not, it could just be bad gun management, you know, or the person doesn't understand safety or whatever. 
or they're forgetful or, you know, there's a lot of different other reasons. It could be abusive though. If the partner has a pattern or, you know, again, we're looking for, when we're talking about intimate partner violence, we're talking about a pattern. We're not usually just looking at one behavior. If it was just one behavior, that'd be pretty weird. If, if the only abusive behavior someone did was to leave a shotgun propped up against the wall, that would be very strange. It would have to be, or it would usually be accompanied with all these messages to the victim that, that, that the perpetrator is in control, that the perpetrator feels they have the right to get angry at the victim, that the perpetrator feels like the victim is incompetent and doesn't uh, deserve any respect, that the, and I'll get into more of this, more of the additional signs, but when we see a pattern of behaviors that are meant to communicate that and are meant to establish control and power and a difference of power, and you have the shotgun laying against the wall, and there's been talk about shooting the spouse, like, Sometimes you just make me so angry, I want to shoot you with my gun. Then we're talking about an abusive pattern. But if we just heard the twit, the tweeter, the twit, <laughs> the Twitter, tw- can you tell I don't use Twitter and I'm old? Um, uh, that if we just heard on Twitter, or if you just heard a friend saying, my husband leaves his gun against the wall, that's abusive. Well, it, in that person's world, that's okay. And we don't want to be, we don't want to be skeptical of people's accounts of abuse because it usually indicates it's actually happening. The vast majority of accusations of abuse are but just the tip of the iceberg of what's really happening. There are occasional bad actors who will make claims like this, but usually usually it's credible and when you look into it. But, but if that's all we heard, then we wouldn't really know. We'd have to see the bigger picture. If the, if the person, if you ask the question like, so when he leaves the gun out, do you feel afraid? And if they said, yeah, I do feel, I do, I feel threatened. Has he ever threatened you before? Does he give the impression that he, he could hurt you? And the victim would say, oh yeah. I mean, he, he, when he loses his temper, uh, I get real scared. And he sometimes talks about taking his anger out of or whatever, you know, there would be more to it than just the gun. But anyway, uh, abusive relationships almost always, if not always, have some element of intimidation. And again, like I said, this basically creates a an emotional environment where the victim feels like they can't be themselves. They can't speak up. They can't do what they want to do. They're walking on eggshells. The abusive person might threaten the children. They might threaten the pets. They might threaten themselves. That's something that uh, we heard in in the Marilyn Manson episode. Allegedly, Marilyn Manson would threaten to kill himself. And if you've never been in this sort of situation, you might be like, well, what's, who, why would you care? If your abuser threatens to kill themselves, wouldn't you be like, fine, go kill yourself. What do I care? But there's inherent uh, fear in, in, all, in, in that situation. Let me try to describe a potential scenario. So, Again, this is a pattern, remember? And for five years, you have a partner that scares you, but you you have a loving relationship, particularly in the beginning, and you feel like you've found you know, uh, your, your soulmate, and you have a lot of good times together, at least more good times than you've had with previous partners. And sometimes they lose their temper, sometimes they get a little too drunk, Sometimes they say things that they don't really mean and you sort of excuse away. And then over time, they, they seem to get angry more often. The behaviors get a little worse. But every behavior, as it gets worse, is just a little worse than the previous behavior. So at first, it's like he punches the wall when he's angry and he walks out of the room. And you're like, whoa, he, he, put, a, he put a hole through the drywall. That's a, that's a big deal. But on the scale of things, you've seen that before. Maybe your dad did stuff like that. Maybe you've done stuff like that. And you sort of categorize it as, you know, it's normal behavior. And then a little later, uh, you get in another argument and you're you're in the car and he starts driving real fast. And you say, hey, could you slow down? And he's just like, no, you know, you can't tell me what to do. And he's He's weaving in and out of cars and, and you're terrified. You're thinking, oh my God, we're going to die. 
And then you stop the car and you start arguing some more and you say, uh, why were you driving like that, like a crazy person? Were you, you know, you're, you're trying to scare me. And the person's like, no, I was just driving fast. And you, you just can't handle things like that. Like it's no, it's no big deal. That's another thing is abusive people almost never admit that they did something wrong. They almost, they almost never apologize because in order for them to keep up that pattern, they have to establish that they're right and you are wrong. And they have to establish that their behavior is justified. And they often think that their behavior is justified. And, justified. and again, that's why domestic violence treatment took so long, because we had to convince them that their behavior was wrong. And that, that was the, the central uh, target. You know, there were a lot of other targets that we would target with these perpetrators, but the central story that they had to eventually believe in their heart was that the crime they committed was their fault and they should not have done it. And most of the perpetrators did not think that. When they came into the group, they thought that they should not have been a convicted of a crime or that the law was wrong or something, or that their spouse was overreacting. And it was our job to change their mind. So anyway, getting back to my example, then one day the two of you are drunk and you like to drink and he likes to drink and he and you get into this you know the next morning you wake up and you kind of remember what happened and you kind of have hazy memory of it and you're just like yeah we really had i don't know how the start how the fight started but eventually we were screaming at each other about all sorts of stuff and then he pushed me down and he pushed me against the wall and and then he then he punched another hole in the wall and so if that was the first behavior, like, you know, date five, he pushes you down, you might walk away and go, I don't want to be with this person. But it was slow. And again, the first instance was a punch in the wall. The second instance, a month later, is driving too fast. The third instance is punching the wall again, but also pushing you down. But, you know, you both were drunk and you were raising your voice too. And so you justify it to yourself in that way. And the the key part of all this is that a, a lot of people don't talk about this, is that we have attachment needs, right? We all understand that. If you're listening to this podcast for long enough, you understand that we are attachment creatures. In the same way that we need food and water, we need attachment. We need relationships where we feel secure. We need people around us. We depend on emotional security for a lot of functioning emotionally and physically in our, in our minds and bodies. And so when we... Uh, and so let's take a, a healthy example. If a good relationship that doesn't have a lot of problems, they have an argument, it's normal. Well, what's stopping the couple from just saying, screw it, we got an argument and I don't like this right now, l l I'm going to leave. Well, what's stopping the two individuals from leaving the relationship is the fact that they need attachment. There's a tension between, I don't like being in conflict with you I don't like fighting with you. And we've been in the same fight over the past five years. I want to avoid that fight. The seemingly the only way to avoid this frustration is to leave you, but I need you for my attachment needs. Okay. So when you're in a, when you're in a abusive relationship, the same applies. It's not like the uh, victim suddenly doesn't have attachment needs, right? And often the abusive person will use that against the victim by isolating the person, which is another part of the abusive wheel, and making it so the victim can only get their needs met through the abusive individual. Now, before I go on, so I'm all over the place, but uh, this is my conceptualization, and this is another point that I find a lot of people don't bring up. Usually people will just talk about abusive people and they'll just say, well, they're abusive, they're trying to break you down, they're trying to gain control in the way that I have been. But why do they want to do that? Why would a human being want to control another person and have that person hate you all the time? Why would you, I mean, there's so many, there's so many better ways to, to live. Why would you want to live your life uh, bothering with controlling another person in a, in a very systematic way? Why would you do that? Well, there are two 
uh, large categories I want to talk about. The first category is a psychopath or a, or a sadistic person. This person is out to harm other people. They don't have empathy. They don't care. And so you are just a thing to them. You're just an object. And so they're just using you. And in those situations, the, that's a psychopath, someone suffering from any social personality disorder. And they're particular, but this is rare. We're talking about, I don't know, one, maybe 2% of the population are even capable of that kind of uh, you know, behavior given their sort of biology or their development or their personality disorder. That's really rare. The rest of the people, in my experience, and I've treated a lot of perpetrators both in my early career and later, are operating from a place of attachment desperation. When someone, we, we've all been in these shoes. We've all felt like, oh my God, I'm going to lose this person. Oh my God, this person is breaking up with me. Oh my God, I don't, I don't want to be alone. Why is this person rejecting me? We've all been there, right? And there's a lot of ways to cope with that. You can cry into a pillow. You can drink your feelings away. You can find another partner. You can go to therapy. You can go for a run. You can journal. You can create more. You can depend on your friends more, your family more. You could give up on dating. There's a lot of different ways to cope with that rejection hurt and, and fear. Well, one of the ways that is clearly available to humans that some humans will resort to based on the way they were raised, either through modeling or other kinds of environmental things as a childhood, is in the childhood, is that they will control the other person. We Again, we all are fearful of being rejected, but a small percentage of us, when we are worried about rejection, a small percentage of us will control the other person as a way, as a shortcut way, a dysfunctional way of trying to get proximity to the other person. You know, let me give a very common example that I often give is that the wife has a job, she comes home and she's a little late and the husband is waiting there and uh, he it has been steaming. He's just like, you know, where have you been? And he, the woman walks in the house and is like, oh, you know, she, I don't know. I just, I think I lost track of time at work. I, I was, you know, talking with someone and uh, sorry, I'm a little late. Well, I've been waiting here and I, you know, I called you and you didn't answer the phone and, oh, I'm sorry. I must have silenced my phone before I left work. I, you know, I was, I was just driving home and I got caught, caught in traffic. Love. Sorry, you know, I didn't answer the phone. Well, this is just, you know, a bunch of, who were you talking to at work? Who, who were you talking to? Oh, um... Well, I, I, I was just talking with some coworkers. Was it a man or a woman? Okay. So in this situation, very common situation, the behavior is the abusive part, right? But the underlying feeling is universal. You're sitting there and you're feeling like, huh, I wonder where my spouse is. And it's not uncommon for even the most secure of us to have a flash thought of, is my partner cheating on me? <laughs> I mean, even for us secure people or for the secure people out there, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility and your brain potentially will have that cross its mind every now and then, maybe not all the time. But how do we cope with that? And if we have inner resources and secure relationships, then we'll, we'll go either, no, I mean, this, this, she's probably just late and... Two, I need to deal with stuff on my own. And three, uh, even if she were to be cheating on me, like, I guess I'll find out eventually. I sort of trust the universe to point me in that direction or she'll leave me and that'll be sad. But, you know, it's nothing to be desperate or rat right now. And so there's other ways of coping with that worry. But for the abusive person, they deal with it in a very particular way which is, again, a shortcut of gaining proximity, which is to control the other person because the, the abusive person believes that if I can intimidate emotionally the other person such that they never do this again, then I won't feel that way again and I will be proximal emotionally and physically to my loved one. But of course, this doesn't work ultimately because even if the partner does stay, even if the victim does stay in the relationship with you, they emotionally will pull away from you or they'll just emotionally pull away from the world. And so that there's 
always distance being created by that which causes this is which causes this feedback loop with the abuser constantly trying to grasp for contact with the victim and never able to reach them because their method of trying to get proximity to their partner actually pushes their partner away emotionally. And that's why often this stuff escalates. Now, I'm not blaming the victim for this pattern. It is completely the perpetrator's fault. But the way that the dynamic occurs between perpetrator and victim will often cause it to increase. Because as the distance increases, as the distance compounds itself without any real resolution for the perpetrator, the perpetrator's feelings will escalate and thus their behaviors will escalate. They're more jealous in the future. You know, As time progresses, they get more and more jealous. They get more and more afraid. They get more and more hurt. They get more and more scared of, of the distance that they feel. And thus, they have greater reactivity and greater control and greater justification for their behavior because they're so hurt and they're so afraid. So anyway, <clears throat> getting back to my example that I started 20 minutes ago, or maybe even longer. So the, the, the relationship uh, progresses to not just pushing you down, but now there was a slap across the face one time. There was a threat to kill you. There was a knife drawn one time, or there was a threat to take the children away, or um, other kinds of escalation. And each each step down the road, it, it gets worse, but it's not that much worse in relation to the previous set of behaviors. And each step of the way, the victim says, well, yeah, this is, you know, people do this, or, you know, he gets mad sometimes, or this is the way relationships are. You know, victims often come from households when they were children that had a lot of violence, and so it feels normal to them. Anyway, so then the the perpetrator, oh, so as time goes on, the relationship is still one of dependency between the two people, and now you're isolated from your families and friends, you're terrified of the fact that you don't have a job because the perpetrator's taken away that from you. And the perpetrator often will have escalations in anger and you have you know, the corresponding terror in response to their anger. And then they start to actually threaten to kill themselves. So the person says, if you leave me, I'm going to kill myself. And again, get, this is my whole thesis that I'm saying. Imagine uh, someone says that. Well, from the outside, you're just like, well, who cares? You know, if the person kills himself, well, good riddance. I mean, if you hate the abuser, then you know, good. But remember that the victim has had their their whole psychology has been broken down to believe, almost like uh, you know Stockholm syndrome, that the abuser is a good partner, that the abuser is smarter and more capable than them, that the abuser has you know, all the keys to all the locks of life, that that the perpetrator can really do anything, that the perpetrator could go to the law, and sometimes they can, and get the police to, get, you know, go along with what they say. And if the perp- and if the perpetrator kills himself as a victim, you might feel like you'd be on your own. And this happens a lot too, is that when a lot of victims, when they've been broken down emotionally and psychologically for, for years, potentially starting when they were children, a big thing that will, a very frequent thing that will happen is they manage to extract themselves from the relationship, but then they go right back because they don't know how to function on their own. And I, and it's a, it's, and let me make this more clear because some of you have even emailed me about this is that the, the victim's like, yes, okay, if I can breathe, I'm not scared anymore. And there's usually a honeymoon period where the, this isn't always the case, by the way, this is kind of a particular case, a severe case, where the victim feels relief, the victim finally feels like they can breathe, they don't have to constantly worry, they're out of the house, uh, they're getting their life back together. But, but this creeping feeling will sometimes start to build, and before long, it's this massive throbbing feeling that they have to go back to their to their uh, spouse who who at one time they were a billion percent happy that they left and they're often confused 
and they and they'll say they'll start to justify it like well you know we can make it better and and when after i left he promised he would never do that again he's in therapy now there's all these excuses that people will make uh, and why would they do that well there's a lot of reasons one is is that if you have a lifetime of being abused uh, you deep down believe that you do not deserve a good life and that you can't actually engineer your own life. If you've always been told that you are incompetent and you know nothing and that you are nothing, then the solution is to attach yourself to a powerful person. And if you, and so some uh, victims, when they, survivors, now they're survivors, they've survived, when they start dating again, and on paper, they know what they're looking for. They're looking for someone who is nice and non-abusive and listens to them and doesn't have a history of violence and abuse. But they start dating people like that, and they don't really feel it because deep down for the victim, for the survivor, they've been taught so thoroughly and so, uh, you know, with such longevity that they are nothing and that they don't deserve anything and they can't do anything on their own. They can't meet people, they can't even date on their own. They're, they're, they're deep down being told they're so worthless that no one will love them. But they need love and they need closeness. And they know if they go back to the perpetrator, the perpetrator will let them back in. But what they don't know is that if they venture off into the great unknown and start dating nice guys or nice people, that these people will actually love them and not leave them. And that these other people, uh, there's also not a guarantee that the other people won't become abusive, maybe even more abusive than their previous partners. There's just no way to know. You can't detect that in someone. There's no way to know, you know, by date 10, whether or not this person is, is an abusive person. It's You just won't know until time, you know, time will tell, particularly if you have a history of being abused and you have a hard time even picking up on the subtle signs of it. Anyway, so when so that's one reason why when you, uh, a perpetrator threatens to kill themselves, you would be scared. Another is that it's terrifying to think about someone doing any violence, even if it's against the self. It's very scary, right? I mean, I think all of us can agree. If I don't think any of us would want to watch someone kill themselves, right? Even if we didn't even know them. If we were just walking down the street, we, we don't want to watch the violence, even if it is against themselves, and we're not personally threatened. It's terrifying and tra traumatizing to watch violence happening outside of us, right? So you know that's another reason. Another reason that some people would be afraid is that if you have kids together, you'd be worried about the kids being a, uh, seeing that or knowing that their parent, you know, one of their parents killed themselves. And it's pretty clear that when someone is angrily talking about killing themselves, that there's at least an implicit, if not an explicit threat, that I'm going to take you with me. If someone is willing to kill themselves because of their anger against you, it's not, it doesn't take a genius to draw a connection between, the poss you know, between that and the possibility that if they're going to kill, if they're so desperate that they're going to kill themselves, uh, there's a good chance they're going to kill me first. So that's another reason. There's a lot of other reasons, but anyway, getting back to the wheel, the abuse wheel, and this is taking way longer than I thought I was going to talk about this for. <laughs> As usual, I thought I was going to go to... Colin put together this long list of all these emails and questions and stuff, and I'm, I'm literally on the first one. But, you know, that's the way things go. Um, all right, so the other part of the wheel is using emotional abuse, so again, we have coercion, then we have intimidation, now we have emotional abuse. This is breaking down the victim's internal sense of their own power, making the victim feel incompetent, calling the victim names, humiliating. Did I say client? I mean victim. Um, what am I saying? <laughs> calling the victim names, humiliating the victim, and playing mind games with the victim. Uh, another, The fourth part of the wheel here is using isolation. So using jealousy or denying the victim access to friends and family. The other part of the wheel here is minimizing, denying, and blaming. So this is minimizing the abuse, denying the abuse, or blaming the victim for the abuse. Using the children is another element of the, of the wheel. 
this is like threatening to take the children away or triangulating the children. Like you would go to your child, the perpetrator goes to the children and says, look what your mother did to me. Now, by the way, I've been completely genderizing this as an abuse as the male. Uh, and I'm, I, I promised myself I wouldn't do that. Um, a lot of the literature does this. Like on the wheel, the next item says using male privilege. Using male privilege. And certainly we see in the data a lot more abusers are men. It's just a fact. So it's not a uncommon generalization. The generalization isn't... It, it, anyway, the point is, is that I don't want to do that because many women are abusive, not only in heterosexual relationships, but gay relationships. So we need to uncouple that for a variety of reasons. One, because it's not accurate to just label all abusers as men. But also, if you are abused by a woman, given our discourse, even in the clinical literature that abusers are men, a lot of victims by female abusers will not think of themselves as victims because it's preposterous to imagine a woman being abusive because it's never talked about. So we have to be clear about that. And I've treated uh, female abusers on a variety of levels. And it can look slightly different at times, but often it's it's the same, you know, and you definitely can have all the same elements. There there are cases of, of women who do all the classic things, again, in heterosexual and gay relationships. So, you know, we need to remember, and I'll, I'll tell a story later on, um, a fictional story involving a woman who was abusive. Okay, so another part of the wheel here is using male privilege. I like to say using gender because male privilege obviously is used to abuse women, but that implies that if the abuser doesn't have access to male privilege, meaning they're a woman, that they can't be an abusive person. You can use gender in a variety of ways. Uh, just sticking with male privilege, a man upholding attitudes that men are supposed to be in charge, that's using male privilege, or a man using religion to gain power, a lot of religious religious dogma is centered around male privilege and male dominance, and so some male perpetrators will use religion in that way. But let's talk about women, okay? Women might publicly claim that the, the you know, so let's say you have a, a heterosexual relationship, the woman is the abusive one, and she might actually publicly claim or even, you know, to the legal system that she was actually the victim. Because when the victim speaks up finally, the male victim finally speaks up and says, she, she hits me, all the woman has to do is use the privilege of the assumption that women are always the victims to, to also claim, no, 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 I'm the victim. And with all things being equal, if you have a heterosexual relationship and both people are claiming to be victims, on average, you're going to find people will assume the woman is telling the truth and the man is not. This doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen and it does happen. There's a pretty famous case in the media that I won't identify, but I think some of you might be able to identify that. And so that's using gender. That's a, a woman perpetrator knowing that she has this card she can always pull out. She might even threaten her male victim with that. She might say, if you call the police, I'm going to claim that you hit me, or I'm going to point out that time you pushed me back. That one, Remember that one time five years ago when you pushed me because I was so drunk and hitting you all the time, and you pushed me back? I'm going to point, I'm going to point that out. And I've been telling my friends how abusive you are, and so you better watch yourself. And so you know, there are cases like that. Again, it's, it's rare, but it does happen. And, it, you know, we, we can't just say, well, it's rare, therefore we don't, we're not going to talk about it. It happens. Okay. Another is using economic abuse. Uh, this is the final part of the wheel, and this is preventing the victim from, from getting a job or not giving the victim access to financial decisions or access to even money. And so this is a way of, again, keeping control over the, the, the victim. Okay, so statistics here, just one tiny little statistic that a Canadian study found that among women, and again, these studies never do by non-binary people, so you know we need to change that, but um, they just have two categories of men and women, and so they polled a number of men and women, and 
29% of women said they were abused by a current partner or a former partner. So 29% of women, when you ask them, have you ever been abused by an intimate partner? And they said, yes, 29% said yes. And of men, 7%. So 7% is far less than 29, but 7% is still a lot of people. We're talking about one in 13 people or something. It's a lot of people. So, you know, it's nothing to one in 14 people. Um, it's, it's a lot. So we, you know, just the fact that, you know, the fact, if you know 15 men, uh, statistically, one of them would say, yes, I have been absolutely ab- abused by a past or a current partner. And so it's, it's nothing, it's not, it's not a small amount of people. It's millions of people. Um, okay. So let me tell you a couple stories and then I will go on to another question, I guess, even though we're almost an hour into that. Um, Okay. So let me tell you about a a, a very common profile that um, I have treated. This is fictional. It's not a particular person. Um, A lot of people might hear themselves in this description because it's such a universal thing. So you have a, a woman who... Is and this is just one profile. It's not you know a common. It's just one, just to kind of make it specific. You have a woman who's very nice and she has a job and she likes it and uh, she has kids that are say in you know teenager, uh, middle school age kids, and she uh, is a little anxious, a little on the dependent side. But she's doing pretty well for herself, and she comes into therapy because she feels as though her relationship isn't going that well, and she wants some help with how to improve her relationship. And as she starts to talk with the therapist about her relationship, the therapist starts to ask some very very specific questions. At first, the therapist is like, okay, well, what do you want to work on, and how do you want to communicate better, and... Um, what do you want to say to your husband? And then after a while, the therapist starts reacting a little bit like, wait a second, I'm, I'm hearing some pretty concerning behaviors from your husband. Things like, uh, that make me want to ask the following questions. Do you feel safe around your husband? Um, has your husband ever hit you? And the th- the client says, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I Safe? I don't know if I've ever thought about that before. Um, do, has my husband ever hit me? I mean, there was one time early in our marriage where, uh, he hit me once, but he, he knew he shouldn't have done that. And so he, he's never done it again. Therapist asks, so when, how often is your husband angry? Would you say? And the client says, oh, uh, wow. I, I don't know. He, He's angry almost all the time, or at least it seems like he's almost angry all the time. And the therapist asks, when your husband is angry, do you, how do you feel about that? You know, the client says, well, it doesn't feel good. And I I'm, I'm, I just don't know what to say in those situations. Um, and then what does your husband do when he's angry? And the client says, well, my husband... He, he'll lecture me for like two hours about what he's angry at me about. And, you know, I listen. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's a great time, but I listen. So, um, you know, I'd ask the client, so when he's lecturing you, do you have the ability to tell him, do you, do you want to listen to him lecturing you? And the client might say, well, I don't know if I've ever thought about if I wanted to or not. I guess when I think about it, no, I, I'd rather not, I guess, deal with it. Okay, client, uh, if you didn't want to listen to this person lecturing you for two hours, uh, could you tell your husband that you don't want to listen? The client would say, oh, no. Uh, he's so angry in those moments that uh, I couldn't. I couldn't possibly say anything to him uh, because uh, he he wouldn't listen to me. Okay. Does he ever call you names? 
client says, oh, yeah, when he gets angry, he calls everyone names. He calls people at work names. He calls me and he calls the kids names. He, he get, he's real emotionally uh, erratic. You know, okay, so uh, there's other kinds of things we could go into. But this is a more subtle abusive relationship where there's not overt violence and maybe not even overt abusive, uh, you know, intimidation, violent intimidation. But there is control and there is a, a emotional intimidation. You are walking on eggshells around this person. This person is forcing you to do things that you don't want to do. This person is often angry and feels entitled to dump all that anger on you and doesn't ever apologize and doesn't ever reflect on their responsibility and their own and their own issues. It people like this, you know, the, the husband won't ever say, you know what, there's something wrong with me. And the profile that I'm telling is someone maybe suffering from narcissistic personality disorder, the husband. And underneath all that behavior is a deep abyss of worthlessness that they're running from constantly. And they're in this constant state of trying to gain superiority over others. And they're very envious of others and very triggered to anger because when they aren't able to uphold their narcissistic um, veil and supply, they will get angry because they're, they're terrified and they're very scared. So that's an abusive relationship. Okay. So let me tell you about another abusive relationship. We have a man who is married to an abusive woman. And if he were to describe his situation, he might say something like, uh, well, so say you ask all the right questions. And he says, well, in a fight, in a physical fight, I mean, she's smaller than me and she's a lot smaller than me. So I suppose in a physical fight, I would win but she's way more emotionally volatile than I am. And I'm much more even keeled. And I never know what she's going to do when she gets upset. When she gets upset at me, like if I hurt her feelings or something, or if I don't do what she wants me to do, I, I don't know if I'm going to get the nice one or the normal one, or if she's going to explode, or if she's going to take substances and then really fly off the handle. I don't know if she's going to make me stay up all night as she tries to work out our problems. I mean, there are times when I just have to go to bed because I have to wake up the next day to go to work, and I plead with her, and I say, will you please just let me go to sleep because I have to work tomorrow. Can, can we just can we talk about it tomorrow? And my cat wants to chime in. Listen to that purr. Okay, where was I? So he would say, I, you know, I try to go to bed, but, but she keeps me up all night because she has to get a lot of things off her chest and she, she's just extremely insistent. And, and I guess, again, I know I could overpower her, but she's so volatile. I, I just don't know what she's capable of. There are times when I worry that she would get so angry that she would actually she could actually kill one of our children. I mean, she's never threatened to actually kill one of our children, but she just get she I don't know, she just seems so out of control sometimes when she's angry at me. And she gets angry at me about the the most strangest things. Like I didn't call her one time when I said I was going to call her and I came home and she she had already thrown all my stuff out on the lawn and I was pleading with her to to calm down and the children were watching and and so now when she calls I actually I I have a physical fear reaction because I'm worried I don't know I'm just so scared when I see her calling me or when I see her texting me my heart starts to race a little bit because I'm worried that something's going to happen, even though most of the time when she calls me and she texts me that every, everything's fine. But occasionally, like something real kind of scary will happen. And, you know, she's never punched me, but 
the things she says sometimes. And, you know, I know she has a troubled past and I know she's had violent relationships in the past. She, she talks about them sometimes. And I don't know. I'm just, I just don't know. I just don't know what she would do because of, you know, the way she talks. And she does talk about killing herself sometimes. And I don't know. I'm just, I'm just really exhausted with the constant efforts of trying to keep her calm. Okay. So that's another element is victims of a particular style of relationship and abusive relationships, they will feel an element of it is they will feel like they're in a constant state of managing the perpetrator's mood. Because if they can manage to get the perpetrator to be in a good mood, or at least to like them, then the victim will not be victimized, or at least there's a greater, a lesser likelihood of that happening. And so uh, this will effectively erase any opportunity for the victim to reflect on their life and wonder if they even want to be in the, in the relationship or make plans to leave the relationship because the victim is in this constant state of survival. It'd be like if you didn't have any food and you had to get in physical fights with others just for a few calories every day. You don't have time to self-actualize and to work on your latest creative project because you're focused on survival and victims are often in that in that state where they're in this constant state of just get through the day just get through the day and when you're in a state like that you don't have the luxury to even ask the question do I want to be here and if I don't then what do I do it's too much and so our brains aren't capable of processing all those things at the same time we in order for us to think about higher things like what do I want in life, everything has to be a, everything has to be comfortable. We have to have food, we have to have physical safety, we have to have shelter. We have to not be suffering from trauma. And a lot of these victims not only obviously have trauma from their spouse, but they have previous trauma as well. And when you're in that constant survival state, the question of what do I want just never comes up because that's a luxury. To ask yourself what do I want is a luxury. It's a luxury of safety, of long-term safety. If you have, you know, a lot of victims when they finally do get out of these relationships, usually with a lot of support, they will take years before they can even begin to ask questions of what do, who am I and what do I want? Even if they had that growing up, being in a long-term abusive relationship will break that down for you, and you've got to rediscover that. Some of you out there have probably been there before. Anyway, so that is me answering Jess's question. Let's take a break, and let's make this a long one, and I'll answer some more questions. All right, we're back from the break, and so some other anonymous questions here. We have someone saying, I had a friend who felt that it was abusive. If I didn't agree with their point of view, they thought I was gaslighting them. Is this abuse? So just going off of your description here, Anonymous, you're saying, I had a friend who felt that it was abusive if I didn't agree with their point of view. Well, I don't know the situation, obviously, but based on that description, that does not meet the definition of abuse. Not agreeing with someone's point of view at least uh, in that broad sense, is not abusive. Could it be abusive? Yeah. If it was in the context of a pattern of control and a pattern of harm, then it could be a part of a larger pattern of of abuse, right? If, for example, in the examples I was giving before, you have a the woman who is abusing her her husband through emotional intimidation and Let's say the husband's like, you know, sometimes your your emotions are so big and your anger is so volatile and so sudden that I feel like I have to walk on eggshells around you. Okay, well, now let's say that the abusive person says, well, no, actually, it's you that have the problem because you're too sensitive. Okay, so in that situation, the abusive person is disagreeing 
with the victim's point of view. And it is part of a larger pattern of abuse. But if you are with your partner or friend or someone, and they're like, I believe that abortion should be illegal. And the other person is saying, well, I believe in pro-choice. Well, that's not abusive, obviously. <laughs> so the way you described it is, uh, yeah, it's not abuse. And now, can someone feel like they're being abused while they're not being abused? Yes. Can someone feel like someone is gaslighting them, but they're not actually being gaslit? Yes. That happens often, honestly. Another anonymous question. In terms of sexual abuse, what makes it abuse and what makes it an unhealthy dynamic? End of question. Yeah, it's a good question. Again, there's no technical delineation in the clinical sense between abuse and quote-unquote unhealthy dynamic when it comes to sexual abuse. You know, if we're talking about, I believe the anonymous person is talking about intimate partner situations. Let's say you have someone that it wants to have sex and the other partner says, I'm not in the mood. And the person who wants to have sex starts to get angry or starts to say things like, well, I want a divorce if you're not going to have sex with me. Or, or there's a implication that if you don't have sex with the partner, that that uh, partner will be a bad parent that day or something. Well, do we call this abuse because you're trying to coerce someone sexually? Or is this an unhealthy dynamic? Well, it's both, right? Um, and depending on your, the sentence you use, I suppose you could use either. But, but you know, it's, again, it's, it always comes down to control. Is, is there a sense and safety? It's all about control and safety. So if there's a controlling element to it, even if it's inadvertent, I've seen this happen before where the perpetrator isn't entirely conscious of the fact that they're using intimidation. Now, some abusers absolutely know they're using intimidation, but some abusers aren't entirely conscious of what they're doing. It's absolutely coercive and controlling and intimidating, but it's, it's a little bit out of their awareness. To them, they're just expressing how they feel. Anyway, another question here. If one partner has more power and control in the relationship and feels entitled to sex, then at what point is it coercion? Okay, this is a good question. So let's break this down. So let's say that one, you're saying here that one partner has more power and control in the relationship for whatever reason, economic control, um, you know, privilege control, uh, relationship kind of general control. They're the ones that usually steer the boat. They're the ones that usually make the decisions. They're the ones who have bigger emotions or make their needs more vocal or something. So, so this person has more power and control. But, but let's say it's, it's not clearly abusive, right? So we'll say it's within kind of normal limits of difference of power, if you will. Some people would say that was ever normal, but I'm saying it's, you know, before the threshold of abuse. Because if we cross into abuse, like the example I gave before, then it's like, well, it's just, it's just abusive. But if one partner has, shall we say, slightly more power and control in the relationship, and that person feels entitled to sex, meaning that that, that partner feels like you are my spouse, and whether or not you want to have sex with me or not, you're going to have sex with me because we're married and that's your job or whatever the, the situation is or they behave in ways that are essentially that way. They don't really care if you are in the mood. They're, they just want to have sex with you. Then you ask, you know, then at what point is it coercion? Well, it's always coercion. <laughs> and now, now, if someone has more power and feels entitled, but knows that they feel entitled and knows they have power and don't use it towards bad, uh, you know, efforts then yeah, that's not coercion. But if someone feels entitled to having sex with another person and, ena and enacts behaviors from that entitlement, then that isn't inherently coercive and abusive. To act like you have, you know, it, it's one thing to say, I feel entitled to my partner saying hello to me when I come home from work. Okay, that's a different, but if you feel entitled to have sex with someone, we're talking about, entitlement 
to your entire entire body and and your spiritual self. You know, sex is a big deal, right? And so to feel entitled to have sex with someone, meaning that you want to have sex and the other person doesn't, and you feel like you deserve it somehow, comes from a place that is probably generating a lot of attitudes and behaviors that are in the direction of abuse and, and coercion. And that that isn't the only thing. Now, if someone temporarily feels frustrated and they're like, oh, we're married. How come we're not having sex? Okay. Might that not be an entitlement? Might it be a frustration? Might it be an expression of that? Might it be a bad word choice and the person doesn't actually feel entitled, uh, but they're frustrated? Okay. Yeah. I'm mean, So it, it depends on what, where it comes from. It depends on how it's being received. And but what I want to say is that I'm not saying that there's a clear scientific delineating line between one scenario that's abusive and the other that's not, because we're talking about human behavior and opinion and nuance. And and so that's why the word abusive is, it's just kind of a rough word. And, I, and people need to be more specific, like you're using the word coercion. That's more specific, right? Um, it's like the word gaslighting. In fact, I, I want to do a whole episode on, on gaslighting and other kinds of things related to that because of the, the way in which our society is using gaslighting. It is, uh, I, th- I think it just needs to be clarified for people. All right, let's answer some more questions. All right, Olivia said on Facebook, she says, um, most children in abusive situations grow up to be abused, grow up to abuse or to be abused. I'd like to hear your thoughts on ending the cycle of abuse. Okay, end of question. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people who grow up in abusive families will go on to abuse themselves or they will be abused. So how do we end the cycle? Well, a lot of things need to be done, and it's usually in some sort of therapeutic context. And I'll tell you what I've, what I've done in my work. So someone comes to me, they were abused as a child, and they're currently in an abusive relationship, or they have a pattern of being in abusive relationships. The first thing that needs to happen is they need to get in touch with who they are and and what they are and how they feel and what their needs are. In order for them to get in touch with their needs and their feelings and who they are, they have to feel worthy. They have to have people ask them questions like, what do you want? Who are you? How do you feel? repeatedly over and over again. They have to add, add, this is, this is the development of self, right? They have to feel safe enough in their life and in their relationship to begin to explore that. So that's, that's the first thing. Then a lot of deprogramming needs to happen in terms of, I, um, I deserve to be treated well. These are fundamental notions that victims or people who grew up with abuse will intellectually understand. They understand intellectually. Yes, I do deserve to be treated well by other people, but deep down they they absolutely know that they don't deserve to be treated well because that's what life has taught them. Now, what do you do about the abusers? What do you about the, you know, the people who grow up being abused and they grow up to abuse as, as adults? Well, they have to learn a, a different set of things, but similarly, they have to get to know their needs in a way that is realistic, meaning that, you know, I need sex right now, and so I deserve it. It's like, okay, well, what's fine, but let's sort of focus on your need. Let's not focus on necessarily how to satisfy it. Let's focus on your emotions. Let, let's focus on your traumas. Uh, let's listen to you. How do you feel about things? Let's talk about your vulnerabilities and allow that to be said so that you can feel safe. A lot of perpetrators have never really been given a chance to be vulnerable and to have someone take care of them. And then they have to deprogram themselves of various different potentially misogynistic ideas or at the very least entitlement ideas or uh, ideas of the normalcy of violence in relationships. And so it takes years and it takes, it, it, to some extent, you know, I've, in, in my practice, I've treated a lot of people on various points on that spectrum, whether victim or abuser. And I'll tell you that it, you can go to a lifetime of therapy and get like halfway down the road. And I know that that's depressing. And I know a lot of you will email me and be like, 
it, it's demoralizing to hear that a lifetime of therapy will only get me halfway down the road. And I hear you. But life is not inherently without suffering. And all of us have relational traumas that we are uh, carrying with us. And in the same way that if you know your parents die or your spouse dies or a child dies or you go through a real rough divorce, the pain of that never goes away. So the relational trauma pain and the feelings, they never go away. The, the crying never stops. You know, you temporarily stop, but there's always tears left to be shed. And, and it, it's just the way life is. And I'm not saying we're not supposed to try because halfway down the road is wonderful. And the, the best example that I can talk about that I know you all know is Bob. You know, Bob talks about what he went through. He was abused as a child, intimidated, scared, and developed disorganized attachment very early in life. And he's been through, I think he said, you know, 30 plus years of intensive therapy. I mean, Bob, the sort of long term therapeutic situations he's been in is just intense. And he still suffers and he still talks about it, but he has happiness, he has wisdom, he has the self-esteem of surviving, but he still struggles and he still, um, you know, he, he it, 30 plus years of therapy and being a therapist has, has not eradicated the trauma and the condition, but he, he would not have gone, he, he would, wouldn't like to go back in time and not have gone to therapy because it only worked part way, right? It's worth all the effort. But anyway, so my point is, is that how do we end the cycle of abuse? Well, it's slowly generation by generation. So um, we, with five, 10 years of therapy, can, can really help someone such that when they have their own children, there, there will be a far less likelihood of there being the sort of um, conditions that can continue the cycle of abuse, if you will. But then those children go to therapy, because all children need to go to therapy somewhat for the way their parents were, and they recover even from the you know little bit of, I don't know, mistreatment, if, if you want to call it that, from their parents. And this, so we end the cycle of abuse by creating a cycle of recovery, I guess is the way to say it. Sarah asks, Hi, Kirk, I'm interested in how we can recognize abuse. It's not always easy to know when the line has been crossed. I would like it if you could chat about the subtle signs of abuse. End of question. Uh, well, Sarah, I think I feel like I probably already answered that in my previous responses, but I don't know exactly what you're asking about. I think there are two different things that I could answer. One is is that, you know, what are the subtle signs of someone being abusive, you know? How do you detect on the first date if someone might be abusive versus what are the subtle signs that I'm being abused currently? Yeah, which I feel, I feel like I answered the second question first, you know, just thinking about power and control. But thinking about how you might detect an abuser in the beginning, that's real tough. But just to give you some anecdotal evidence is... One of the kind of classic signs, and this isn't always indicative of an abusive relationship and development by any means, but someone who falls in love with you very quickly. Now, again, this isn't always the case by any means, but it, it is a red flag or a yellow flag, if you will. Someone that you feel intensely about, someone who clearly feels intensely about you. Now, why would this be? Well, it's not often talked about, but in this way, but the way that, so one way that people describe it is, well, the abuser is trying to gaslight you. They're trying to trick you into being in a relationship because they're looking for someone to control. But my hypothesis is that, again, the only reason why we, why someone would try to control someone is because they're trying to get their attachment needs met. It's not 
justified, it's potentially even criminal to control someone else in an abusive way. But it does provide to me a, a, a sort of cohesive reason as to why someone would do this. People often frame, even in the clinical world, that we have a need for power and control. And we do, but we need a, we don't control or exert power over anything. Like, uh, you know, what's an absurd example? Um, you know, not many of us are trying to control the bird population in our neighborhood. You know, we're not obsessive, like, how many birds are in my neighborhood? You know, because it doesn't affect it. We don't have an, it's not related to a core need of ours. We do have a core need for it for closeness and for emotional security and relational security. And so we will exert control and power to meet that need when we don't know how to meet that need in other ways, or we've been taught that that's the way you're supposed to meet that need. And all of us exert power and control in some way. It looked through a certain lens of power and control. Almost everything in life is based on some communication of quote unquote power. When you say, I love you to your spouse, even in a good relationship, that is kind of at least looked at through a certain lens, a move of power. You are saying, I love you. And it's sort of implied, you now have to say you love me back. And that is control, because there's often an expectation in there. It's not often in a spousal relationship that aside from Han Solo and Princess Leia, where someone says, I love you, and the other person doesn't say, I love you back, like Han Solo says, I know. It, it is a message of, of at least slight expectation, which is slight power. So we all do this, and there's a, there's a progression down the road where it becomes, quote-unquote, abusive, right? And I think most of us can, can detect that. So there's that. All right, another question. All right, Medina on Facebook says, what are some key components as to why some people who have been abused as children become the abuser? Well, in addition to what I've already said, when, when you experience abuse, you are modeled a particular behavior. And the, the, the way I like to make this a clear point when I'm lecturing students is that you speak a native language. Wherever you grew up, there's some language that you speak, right? That And you speak it without an accent, usually. Like for me, I speak a Seattle-accented English. And why do I speak a Seattle-accented English? Well, because my parents spoke uh, Seattle-accented English. Well, did your, you know, did my parents sit me down and teach me syntax and verbs and objects and subjects and conjugations? No, they, they, they just talked and I listened and I talked with them and I learned through experience. Well, the same goes for everything that, uh, that is related to human behavior. You know, why do we, uh, why do some cultures keep track of time and other cultures don't as much? Because when, when you're young, if your culture take, keeps track of time a lot, then you're pretty good with keeping track of time. Whereas another culture where there's not a lot of conversations like that when you're two, three, four years old, then it's not really encoded as a, as a priority. Another culture might talk a lot about sports or, or they might talk a lot about the, the ability to dance or they might talk a lot about the ability to, to speak well or to speak in a particular way, to, to be able to do you know, verbal jujitsu with someone. In other cultures, they won't. And so you, you're you never taught these things explicitly. You just absorb them. And one of the things you can absorb as a child is the notion of the morality of violence and control. And it becomes a part of you, who you are in the same way that I can never stop speaking Seattle-accented English. I can never unlearn that. It, I could spend my whole life learning Japanese, and maybe I become very fluent in Japanese. Maybe even I'm able to speak without barely an accent in Japanese. But I will never be able to get rid of my ability to speak Seattle-accented English. That it's, it's in my bones. We all understand that, right? 
that I can't forget that. And for those of us that grow up in abusive households, we can never forget the very clear lessons that were taught to us and the assumptions that we developed early in life that violence is okay and that controlling another person is justified and that when someone has a feeling they are entitled to take away someone's power, that is okay. So when you ask Medina, you know, what are the, some key components as to why, peop, why some people who have been abused as children will become an abuser? It's because it's almost like their language. They learned the language of relating to other people, and it included a fair amount of entitlement and abuse and intimidation and emotional control. It, it feels okay to them. It feels more moral to them. In the same way that for me, I did not, I did not grow up in a violent household. There was, I, there was never even the hint of violence between my parents, and me and my siblings would occasionally fight, but it was pretty low key. And for me, when I see people being violent, it is very shocking to me, and I react very viscerally to that because there wasn't much of that when I was young. And so for me, I have a physiological reaction to violence that if you grew up with violence, you don't necessarily have because your body just perceives it as normal in the same way that I don't mind Seattle weather because I grew up with it. Someone moves from Los Angeles to Seattle and they can't stop complaining about it. (laughs) And I'm just like, yeah, I... I mean, I guess it'd be nicer if it were 70 degrees and sunny, but um, I don't know. Who cares? There's a little bit of of rain or a little bit of clouds or a little bit of cold. I don't know. It's not the end of the world. And so now I'm not saying everyone goes up in Seattle. It's like there's plenty of people who grow up in Seattle, hate the weather. Point is, is that um, one of the reasons, one of the key components is is normalization. Um, Another is when you are denied the ability as a child to reflect on the self and to soothe the self, you'll resort to very uh, drastic measures to soothe yourself, which could could, could involve violence or control of another human being. All domestic violence perpetrators have a hard time soothing their own emotions and getting their needs met. That's why they resort to violence. As I've been saying from the beginning, they use violence as a way of of meeting their needs. They're, and it's not just because they're trying to get power, it's because they're, they're actually trying to get their attachment needs met, usually. Now, again, I want to remind you that there are people, 1%, 2%, maybe more, of individuals who actually are psychopaths, meaning they don't have empathy, they don't have remorse, they don't care. They can't even really imagine other people's emotions. They have to intellectually get it. Whereas for the rest of us, when we see someone in pain, we actually feel their pain, and it hurts us to see someone else in pain. For the psychopath, it does not. And so for these people, not only does it not bother them to abuse their partner, but they might actually kind of get off on it. And if you get in their way, they will abuse you, at least emotionally, if not physically, because they know that if they press the right buttons emotionally in another person, that they will get what they want. If they want you to have sex with them, or if they want you to let them stay out all night, or if they want you to watch the kids uh, instead of, you know, going to work. And they are a psychopath, and they lack empathy, and they don't, and they're, they're selfish and narcissistic in this way, then they will do whatever it takes. And, and they learn over time that if they scare other people or if they, if they beat other people emotionally or physically, the other people will respond by doing what they want. So there are those cases. But for the vast majority and all the cases that I treated, the abusive people are desperately trying to get their attachment needs met, but they have no idea how to do it. And they don't even really understand why they're doing what they're doing. They don't even understand that they're doing it because of their attachment needs, because they've never been given a space to think about what their needs are and to normalize their own vulnerability. They might have even been beaten as children whenever they cried. They might have even been shamed and humiliated whenever they expressed a quote-unquote weak need, uh, like, I need to be 
hugged or I feel scared, they might have been slapped across the face. And they learned early in life that they consciously shouldn't think that, but even unconsciously, they shouldn't, they shouldn't acknowledge those feelings. Medina has another great question here, which is, what about those survivors who don't become the abuser? Is it about empathy or apathy? Is it that they have an ability or willingness to, self re- to self-reflect? Is it something else? End of question. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of research on this, but it's hard to pin down because there's just so many factors. It, it's literally asking the questions of why do humans do what they do? And we just do not have the ability to refine that question into a clear scientific numerical observation. One day we might, once we have, you know, neurological modeling uh, or even devices uh, that can model every single neuron in the brain, but we just don't really have that yet. And so it's just, it's just we just don't know. But my experience will inform my answer here, which is that there are three different categories. There are those who were abused who abuse. You have those who are abused who become become abused. And then there are those who were abused who neither abuse nor become the abused victim. And what you're asking is like, who, how do we, you know, what, what's the difference here? How, what, what's the deciding factor? Well, again, it's impossible to pin that down, but the things that I've seen, one is, is just something about that person. They, they made a choice or they had a particular resilience or they had a particular um, just sense of, of I'm going to be different. Just something about that person, something unique about that person. You could call it disposition or the way their life situated themselves, or you could just call it an inner strength. Or There's just an, an unknown aspect of human psychology and development and choice making that we just can't really explain. And so uh, some people just seem to rise above things. And we see this all the time. There's all sorts of people who, without any sort of therapy at all, they rise above and they persevere and and they do great things in spite of being treated so poorly, whether it's abuse or sexism or racism or some otherism. They, there's just something different about them. Or maybe it's a like a choice that some people just make it. I don't know. So I'll, I'll include that. But also in terms of uh, development and recovery, some people, although they're being abused, they have some someone in their life who loves them enough. Maybe it's the other parent. Maybe even it's the abusive parent. It's not unusual for an abusive parent to also at times be very loving and secure. So maybe the child victim gets some, at least, uh, attunement and space to develop who they are such that they can know that, it, you know, the difference between entitlement and, and their own needs, they have enough connection with who they are, enough connection with self-soothing, uh, some way of reaching out for help and being vulnerable and getting their real needs met. Or maybe there's a grandparent that took care of them. Maybe there was an older sibling that took care of them and gave them that attunement. So that's a possibility. All right, I think I'll end it there. I have gotten through four pages out of, well, actually, it's more like two pages out of 24 pages of questions. (laughs) So um, I'm going to have to do another episode about this. So tune in next time when I continue with these questions. I mean, I don't know if it'll be the the very next episode, but eventually I'll continue. (laughs) And... Um, let me know what you think. Email us, me, go to psychologyinseattle.com, go to the contact us page, email me from there. And the final word is that, what's the final word? If you are a victim of abuse, and most of us are, by the way, You deserve to be heard. You deserve to cry about it. You deserve to talk about it. You deserve to feel like what you went through was real and that uh, you were actually abused 
You deserve people to validate that for you and really say, yes, you were abused and you deserve the entire world to hug you for what you went through. And it was completely unfair. And yes, there were some things that you did that were wrong, but it does not even come close to justifying what that other person did to you. What that other person did to you was wrong. And the other person either knows it or they don't know it because they've been through a lot themselves. It doesn't justify it, doesn't excuse it, but it does provide context for why that other person did what they did to you. And it was unfair. And it that kind of experience sticks with us the rest of our lives. And if you can relate to this listener, um, you know, I'm sorry you went through that. It is unfair what you went through. Life should be different. People should be different. But they're not. And I'm guessing not enough people have validated you. I'm guessing you've probably even tried to explain to other people what you went through, and at least some people didn't really get what you were saying or don't really understand what happened or can't relate or something. When you go through an abusive relationship, it's particular, man. I mean, it is particular. It, if you've never been through it, it's hard to know what it feels like. It feels like something that only, you know, weak people go through. You know, I, I hear that a lot. People will be like, well, if, if, it, if it happened to me, I'd walk away. Well, I'm here to tell you that I've known, quote unquote, the strongest people on, in, on the planet go through these experiences and go, oh, now I get it. Now I know why people stay. Now I know why it's so hard to leave. Because there's so much at stake and there's so much fear and it's easier to please. And when you wake up in the morning and you're trying to survive, it's sometimes just easier just to say, you know what, I can't think about the bigger stuff. I, I just have to get through today. I need, to, I need to stay alive. I need to keep my children alive. I need to keep my life functional. And if I can't keep this person in a good mood, then something bad is happening. I can't even necessarily think if I want to be in this marriage or not because I, I don't have space to think about that. And I'm not even quite sure if I'm competent to even think about that because I've, I've been convinced that I'm completely incompetent in every way. So, I mean, that's sort of an extreme example, but point is, is that I'm sorry that you went through it. You deserve to be heard. You deserve to talk about it. You deserve to grieve. You deserve to be angry. You deserve to heal. You deserve a lot of space and a lot of time and a lot of listening. You deserve that. And take care of yourself. Take care of others because we all deserve it. We really, really do. (laughs) 